tight. <laughs> so, uh, so it probably fits you really good. It's a nice shirt. Mm -hmm.
hit transition yet, Israel. Don't hit it yet. Unless you hit it already. Did you already hit it? Don't hit it yet. Did you already hit it? You did? Okay, that's fine. Just leave it if you already hit it. Anyway, uh, the other thing that was interesting was he... So we're about to get this Liberia station going, and right, right as we're about to get it done, we've already paid for half of the price of the FM frequency. So he was going to go and take the money to pay for the other half. And we'd have our frequency, we'd have our legality, and we just have to push the button, turn it on, and we are broadcasting. Well, the government there is extremely corrupt, and so all of a sudden, the regulations for broadcasting has suddenly changed to where now you have to pay for five years of uh, bandwidth. You have to pay for it in five year chunks. And before it was only a one year chunk. So, you know, we we're going to pay for a year and broadcast. Now they're saying, no, even though you've already paid for half, you have to pay for five years, which is a huge chunk of money. So it's, it's just interesting. It's like of all the timing, if that had been next week, we would have been totally fine. But the thing is, God knows the timing. The devil knows the timing, and uh, it's just an, a good opportunity to just trust the Lord and to see what he's going to do. You know, either the Lord can get us around that, no problem, get us in, the, in with the right person who will go ahead and let us start, uh, or the Lord could just dump the money in our lap, you know, and help us to be able to do it that way. So it's an interesting situation, but it's just real fascinating. I love seeing the Lord work. The Lord's brought us all the way up to this point, and this is just a good opportunity to trust that God knows what he's doing, and he's going to work this thing out, because... The Lord is eager to get the gospel, I believe, to those lost people all throughout Liberia. And he's more interested in this radio station than we are. So I trust he'll work it out. All right, let's go ahead and get it started. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And we're good to go on the camera, Israel, right? Okay. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to go ahead and start reading here in verse 7. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 says, but unto every one of us is given grace. Oh, I know. One more thing, Israel. Could you move that camera so it can see the board as well? Just kind of, you'll have to move it and probably zoom in or zoom out. But make it so you can see the board as well. All right, Ephesians 4, verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended... First into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Man, Paul has a way of just cramming so much into a few, few verses there. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll get started. Father, I come before you this morning. I pray, God, that you'd bless your word as it goes forth. And, God, I trust you for that. This is your book. And, Father, I just uh, pray that you would speak to the hearts of your people and that your Holy Spirit, uh, God, would minister to your people this morning and help me, Father, to be able to get this information across in a way that would be a blessing and uh, understandable to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Israel, you got that thing all set up properly? Good? All right. All right, so here in the passage, uh, Paul is talking about what we would call the body of Christ. And this is a New Testament term that is used to represent the entire sum of all Christians, the term body of Christ. For example, uh, you know, the world uses similar terminology. The world would use, say, things like, well, you know, the student body. And the student body is not referring to an individual student and his body, but it's referring to a assembly of a bunch of students at the school. Or you might say the body of Congress. And what that is, is that's the assembly of all the individuals in Congress is the body of Congress. So when the Bible speaks of the body of Christ, 
it's a reference to all the Christians who have ever been saved. If you're saved here this morning, you are a part of what's called the body of Christ. And every single person who has ever been saved and been born again, whether all the way back to the start of the church or up until the rapture, all Christians are part of that body of Christ. And that body, that assembly, uh, began at the resurrection of Jesus, and it ends at the rapture. And if you wanted to get really technical, I would argue that the that everybody kind of has these arguments as to, well, when did the body of Christ actually start? If I was to put a date on it, I would personally say that the body of Christ begins uh, with the upper room, when Jesus Christ breathed on the 12 disciples, and he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Okay, so that was the first, essentially the moment when those disciples became born again. So if you, if you, or you could say that the body of Christ begins with the resurrection, but if you're going to start the very first born again Christian, it'd be, it would be those 11 disciples in the upper room receiving the Holy Ghost uh, as uh, for salvation. Now, uh, the body of Christ is also called the church. And it's also called the Bride of Christ. So these are just some different terms that the Bible has describing the same thing. Each term has a different application, uh, but in, in general they are all synonymous that describe the multitude of born-again Christians, born-again believers. So the Body of Christ is indicative of an assembly. Okay, so you have Body of Christ... And it's indicative of an assembly. And I know most of you already know all this, I'm sure. The body of Christ is indicative of an assembly, but it's also indicative of a actual, uh, an actual body. Now, I'll explain what I mean by that. There's kind of two applications of this term body of Christ. And we Christians are spiritually the body of Christ, uh, as in the arms, the legs, the hands, the feet, and so on and so forth. And Jesus Christ is the head. So the Bible describes the body of Christ as an assembly of a bunch of people, yes. But there's also an application where when it says the body of Christ, where in some strange way, there's, a, there's an aspect where all Christians form, in, the, in essence, this body of Christ, if you will. I, you say, well, how does that work? I'm not exactly sure, but that's all it says in the Bible. So turn to Colossians chapter 1. Uh, just a little ways over. Colossians chapter 1. I'll show you a few verses on this. And I can't, I, did, I don't fully understand this either, but... Uh, I just uh, relegate it to it's, it's spiritual. <laughs> so I don't understand a lot of these spiritual type things. But uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, it says, And he is the head, Jesus Christ, of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in all things he might have the preeminence. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, turn there. Hold your fingers there in Ephesians chapter 4, but look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And look at verse 12. It says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, right? We have a body, and we have a lot of different members. And all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Okay, in verse 13, he says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized. That's not water baptism. That's that spiritual baptism that you read about in Romans 6. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Now, according to the Bible, a husband and a wife are one flesh, right? Uh, obviously, they're not welded together, this two-headed monster, obviously, we know that. But nevertheless, according to the Bible, they are one and that's a spiritual thing. They are together. Me and my wife are one. If you help and bless her, I count it as if you did it to me. And if a person was to hurt her, I would count it as if they did it to me. As a matter of fact, uh, I would actually be more upset or more happy if you hurt or blessed her than if you did it to me myself. And the same goes for you and your marriages, I'm sure, because why? Because we're one with our spouses. It's, 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 a, it's a thing where the thing that happens to me happens to her. The thing that happens to her happens to me. And the same with the body of Christ. And in John 17, 21, Jesus prayed the Father, and he was praying to the Father, and he asked that they all, all the ones that would believe on him, that they all may be one. 
And he says, As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. All right, so consequently, the way this works is because we're one in Christ, okay? If you wound your brother in Christ, you deliberately trespass against that person and hurt them, Jesus takes it as an offense against himself. You say, well, I would never hurt Jesus. I would never do something to God. But that brother, man, I'm, I'm going to get him. <laughs> well, if you get him, <laughs> you know what the Bible says? 1 Corinthians 8, 12 says, But when ye so sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Jesus takes it personal. Now look at, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll go through this a little bit more. He says, For the body is not one member, but many. You remember when that uh, story, the pretty graphic story in the book of Judges, the Levite and the concubine, she ends up chopping up the girl's body after she's murdered and sends it out to all the part, to places of Israel. She, he sends out 12 body parts, right? But it's all part of that one body. Okay, there's different members to the body. And then in verse 18, if you skip down a little bit, it says, But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. Okay. Verse 21, And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Okay, All the parts of the body are important. Now, what Paul is saying here is every Christian, God has a different task, a different position, a different office for every Christian in the body of Christ. Every Christian is important. There is no such thing as vestigial organs in the body of Christ. Or a vestigial organ being something worthless that can be cut out and you don't need. They used to say that the appendix was a vestigial organ until they realized, oh, wait, no, the body actually needs the appendix. <laughs> so there are no vestigial organs in the body of Christ. Everybody's important, and God has different purposes for every member of the body of Christ. And in verse 27, he says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Now I'm kind of working towards what I'm going to get to here in just a minute. Uh, you get the gist, kind of this thing about the body. But look how Paul is now going to link the different members of the body, you know, you got all these members, you've got to di link these different members of the body to different offices or callings in the body of Christ. Look at verse 28. So he's been talking about the body and the different members. Now verse 28. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, so on and so forth. Okay. Now, that sounds a lot like what we read in Ephesians chapter 4. Look back there. Ephesians chapter 4. There in verse 11, it says, He gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Okay. Now, there might be a chain of command thing here in the verse. Apostles, prophets, Evangelists, pastors, teachers, maybe, maybe you can make that argument, whatever. But the thing that I want to focus on this morning is there seems to be an underlying chronological order here with the body of Christ. And what I want to teach on this morning is the aging of the body of Christ. The aging of the body of Christ. When the church began, it started with the apostles, right? And then there were some prophets that followed them. You read about some actual prophets in the book of Acts, right? Agabus was a prophet, the Bible says. Uh, Philip's daughters uh, were uh, prophetesses, you know, they prophesied. And then you have, uh, at the end, you have these teachers, okay? And so the point I'm trying to make here is that as time went on, these offices progressed and they started to fade away. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 gives that same order. It says first there's apostles, then there's prophets, then there's evangelists, and then pastors and teachers. And the last two it puts together, pastors and teachers. Okay? So what I'm, gonna, what I'm sh saying here is it looks to me like there's some kind of progression that's going on here with the body of Christ. When you go from Calvary to the rapture, you have apostles, you have prophets, you have evangelists, and then you have, I should probably space these out a little bit, but then you have pastors and teachers. All right? 
It looks like there's something like that going on there. Now, a pastor is a teacher because every pastor, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, is supposed to be apt to teach, right? Okay, so look at the purposes of the offices. In verse 12, it says, You're therefore, the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That is to say that these offices, these officers, they don't exist for the benefit of themselves. They're for the benefit of others. A minister is called a minister because he's supposed to minister to others, not demand or require that everybody minister to him, right? And as I've said it before, it, it bears repeating due to the passive mentality of people these days, churches are not miniature kingdoms, okay? And pastors are not to be miniature kings, and congregations are not the miniature serfs or slaves of that kingdom. <laughs> People kind of get the, the, the idea that that's, that's how it works. You know, the, well, the pastor is the king, and you do everything that he says. No, that's not how it works. Pastors and teachers are meant to be gifts to the body of Christ. They are to feed God's people the Word of God. They are to explain the Scriptures to them. They are there to help them grow in their knowledge of the Word of God and their knowledge of Jesus Christ. And this job is of being a pastor, being a, these, all these different offices, these can, these can be done. We can get rid of all these. These can be over and we can be completely finished when we all come into the unity of the faith. Unto the knowledge of the Son of God, when we're all a perfect man, and all of us measure up to the stature of the fullness of Christ. <laughs> well, when's that going to happen? Well, uh, that'll never happen until the rapture. At the rapture, that'll happen. But until then, the Lord has a purpose for these offices, to minister to His body. Okay? And in spite of the efforts of thousands of preachers and thousands of missionaries, that uh, high and tall order that Paul mentions there has never happened. And that will happen when Jesus Christ returns. Now, in uh, verse 14, notice what he says here. He says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. Now, what I want to start drawing your attention here to is this concept of growth in the body of Christ. There are five stages of growth that are given in the scriptures. Five stages of growth. All right. The first one is basically a baby. Babies. All right. The Bible says uh, when you're born again, you are born of the Spirit. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are born again. And as a spiritual, you're a spiritual uh, a newborn, you're an infant. You're a little baby. You've come out of darkness. Your eyes have been enlightened with the first rays of spiritual light in your life. And what is the first thing a baby needs? It needs milk, right? The Bible says in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, right? Now, milk has to do with uh, basically the basics, you know, Christianity 101. Now, let me ask you this. I had to think about this. If we were to say, okay, what are the basics of Christianity? What is Christianity 101? What are the most foundational basics? What are some things that you might say? Anybody? Faith. Faith. Anybody else? What are some basics? Like if a person just got saved, what would, what would be one of the first things that all of us would say you need to do? You need Desire. Trust. Desire for food, trust. Uh, man, these are good answers. These are actually not what I expected everybody to say. Most of the time, it's generally thought, well, the first thing that, you know, a person gets saved, you need to start praying, you need to start reading your Bible, and you need to start witnessing, and you need to start going to church. And then some people would say, well, you also need to start tithing. You know, that's, a, <laughs> that's the most important thing, you know, in some places. Uh, that's not how it is here. But uh, that's what a lot of people would say. You've got to start doing these things. And those things are all good, and those things are, uh, you know, uh, very good things to do. Reading your Bible, obviously, praying, and all those things are good. But there's something in the Bible that's even more foundational than praying and reading your Bible, believe it or not. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. Now he says, desire the sincere milk. Okay, the milk of the Word. Okay, the Word. There's something far more foundational than just reading your Bible, and it's interesting. 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. He says, brethren, I write no new commandment, that's the Word, commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. 
the old commandment is the word. Desire the sincere milk of the word. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. And you're thinking, what did he even just say there? <laughs> well, I, I still don't know what the old commandment and the new commandment is. And, uh, but what he's saying here is he says you got an old commandment and, and a new commandment, and then he's going to explain what these are in the rest of the book. Turn to chapter 3. Okay, so the old commandment is the word that ye have heard from the beginning. Okay, what's that? 1 John 3, verse 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning. What's that? That we should love one another. Hmm, okay. So that's the old commandment. And he says, I'm giving you the old commandment and the new commandment. The old commandment is love one another. Uh, look, at, uh, in 2 John 5, I'll read it for you. It says, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. Okay, so the old commandment is to love one another. Look at the new commandment, verse 23 in uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. <clears throat> and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as He gave us commandment. So those are the two commandments, believe and love. Look at uh, uh, 1 John 5.13. Faith doesn't end when you get saved. Faith is part of your entire Christian life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, those of you that are saved, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You say, well, I, I already believed on the name of the Son of God. Why do I still need to do that? Because faith in Christ is a daily thing. <laughs> Trusting the Lord, not just for your eternity, but for your daily life, okay? Now, so the old commandment is love, and the new commandment is belief, faith, exactly as Sabina said. She, got, she nailed it. The old commandment is love, the new commandment is faith. Now, uh, your salvation began with the love of God for you, right? And it began with your faith in Jesus Christ. Those are the two foundational things of Christianity. Faith and love. Faith and love. Faith and love. Faith and love. Okay? That's the foundation. Let me just say, and this might be shocking in some ways, but the King James Bible is not the foundation of Christianity. Believe it or not. Now, I'm all for the King James Bible. I believe it word for word, 100%. But listen, think about it. Chinese Christians can't read a King James Bible. Pakistani Christians, they don't even own a Bible, much less are able to read a King James Bible. In fact, the entire Bible of 66 books wasn't even collated into one volume until three to 400 years after the resurrection. Do you understand? Three to four hundred years, they didn't have all 66 books of this Bible. And the, and the King James Bible didn't even come out till 1611. So what did everybody do? You say, well, the King James Bible is the foundation. Then nobody had a foundation for the first 400 years of the church, and for the first 1,600 years, if you want to make the foundation the King James Bible. You say, well, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> That's interesting. You see, for the first couple of hundred years, the average Christian didn't own any copies of Scripture. As a matter of fact, for the first couple hundred years, all they had was maybe a, a page of Scripture. My, my Bible, because it's been rebound, has these pages that come out sometime, and I've got to glue them and put them back in. But for the first couple hundred years of Christianity, you and your family would go to this, the church, and they might have a letter of Paul, or a couple of letters that maybe they've copied, but the average Christian family... You might come to church with a blank piece of paper and come up to the pulpit where the Bible might have been chained and copy down some verses, and this was your Bible. Now, I've got 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and part of chapter 2 here, and there's some good stuff in here, like uh, Brother Rowley was talking about, the God of all comfort. I've got that verse. <laughs> but there's a lot that's missing from this piece of paper. There's not, I'm going to miss out on a lot of stuff. But that's how it was for the early church, and really for, for a lot of Christians, even into 1000 A.D. They were being persecuted, their Bibles were being taken and burned. So for, you to, for one to say, well, the Bible is the foundation, well, you need to take a step back and just think about that a little bit. Because a lot of Christians don't even have a Bible. I mean, think about it. The, the, the Word of God is critical, yes, but if you get locked up in a jail cell for 10 years, and you have no Bible... Do what? Do you have no foundation? 
Is your faith destroyed because you're not going to have a Bible? I'm not trying to downplay the importance of the Bible. I'm just trying to get us to think a little bit because the Word of God itself in John indicates that the foundation is faith and love. Because if you're in a jail cell locked up, you know what you still have? You can still trust God and you can still rejoice in the love of God, right? And the Holy Spirit's in you. So when Peter talks about the sincere milk of the Word, the context there in that verse, really, we don't have time to go into all of it, but it has to do with ceasing to do evil, ceasing to do hurtful things to others, and doing good. Hebrews chapter 5, turn there real quick. Hebrews chapter 5. Here's the other place where it talks about the milk. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13. Or verse 12, he says, For when the time... Ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Notice that it doesn't say everyone that useth milk is unknowledgeable in the word of the scriptures. He's un, a person needing milk is someone that's unskillful in the word of righteousness. Okay? Righteousness has to, be do, has to do with doing right. If somebody, the person who needs milk is somebody that needs to be told, this is good and this is bad. Do this, don't do this. As a Christian, you should be able to progress beyond that place in your life where you're still trying to find out the difference between what's right and what's wrong. What God likes and what God doesn't like. That's, all, that's for babies. That's the milk of the word. Okay, and, and the meat is doctrine. The meat is doctrine. The Bible, the, the doctrines of the Bible. You don't, that, that's not for the babies. That's when you get a little bit older. You know when, when you're a baby, you know what people do with a baby? You know what you tell a baby? You don't, when, when a baby is newly born and just you know, the first two years of its life... You're not teaching it to read necessarily. Uh, some people, I guess, do. But you're not telling the baby how to read and, and, all the, and how to hold a conversation, you know, and uh, how to do all these jobs. That's not what you tell an infant. You know what you're telling an infant? You know what to tell, tell an infant that's crawling around on the floor? You know what you tell a baby? You say, no, no. No, no. Hit this little hand when he tries to stick his hand in a light socket. No, no. What are you teaching him? The difference between what's right and what's wrong. Do this and don't do that. You know what else you're trying to teach that little baby? You're trying to, you, you know, the baby is uh, maybe trying to stand on that little coffee table and his legs are wobbly and you're holding your hands out just about five inches away. You want to see if that baby will, and you say, come here, come here, come here. And the baby, you know, ah, and <laughs> you grab onto the baby. What are you teaching him? Faith. You're teaching the little baby, you can trust me. You know what you tell a baby all the time? I love you, I love you, I love you. It's faith and love. Faith and love. And the milk is the milk of righteousness. What's right and what's wrong. It's all the basics. That's for the babies. The basics are for the babies. And the basics is not prayer and Bible reading. The basics is this is right and this is wrong. Do this. Don't do that. This is bad. This is good. This is sin. This is good. You know, and trust God. God loves you. That's for the babies. All right. Now, that's good for anybody. You know, I still like drinking milk. To this day. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't live off of it like a baby does, okay? Now, when you get a little bit older, you should have progressed to where you're not having to be taught, you, you know, faith. You're not having to be taught love. You should, you, as a Christian, a Christian that's been saved for 20 years should know that he should love other Christians. He shouldn't be treating other Christians badly, he shouldn't be uh, uh, doubting his salvation after 20 years of being saved. That shows a lack of belief in the Word of God, a lack of trust in God, a lack of discipline, a lack of care for the things of God. A carnal, selfish Christian who has a lot of knowledge but doesn't have, the, doesn't have this faith, doesn't have this love thing figured out, you know what that is? You're going to just end up being a Christian that beats people over the head because you know more than them. You got to get that faith and love thing down. There's some Christians that still don't have that down. They've got a lot of knowledge, but they don't have the faith and the love thing down. That, those are important. And uh, God wants His children to get the foundation of faith and love first, and then build upon that with a strong meat of Bible teaching and doctrine. Okay, so the next phase of growth, moving through these things, is little children. All right? Little children. 
And little children, at the Last Supper, uh, that has to do with a disciple. At the Last Supper, Jesus called the 11 disciples that were in there in private with Him. He called them little children in John 13, 33. He says, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come, and so now I say unto you. Discipleship has to do with being a little children. So little children equals disciples. This is actually where Bible reading, prayer, witnessing, going to church, that's where these things come in. It has to do with daily diligence and disciplining yourself to do things regularly. It takes discipline. You don't expect a little baby to have discipline. But as a, as a child is little, as you know, Ezra and Judah and you, the kids start getting older, you start teaching them to discipline themselves and teaching them good disciplines. And getting up early and reading your Bible every day, takes discipline, okay? And spending some time in prayer before you go to bed every night takes discipline. Getting up on Sundays and getting dressed and getting up early and getting dressed and going to church takes discipline. Trying to have tracks in your pocket every time you go out to give somebody a track, that takes discipline, okay? And just as every human should grow, so every Christian should be growing. And when a baby doesn't grow and remains infantile all his life, that's not something we celebrate. That's a tragedy. And when a Christian remains infantile all his life and never grows, never gets these basics down, it, it, and remains a baby his whole life, that's not something to celebrate. That's a tragedy. That's sad. And um, <clears throat> so these things take discipline. All right. The Apostle John then gives the next two stages of growth. Look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Now these are, this is kind of a <clears throat> basic lesson this morning. You might know this, or maybe this will just kind of help put things in order for you. So the next uh, stage of life that's given in the Scriptures is young men. 1 John 2.13, I write unto you fathers, because you have known him that is <coughs> from the beginning. I write unto you young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children, because you have known the father. All right, so young men, you say, well, what are young men? I'm going to say that young men are the zealous newbies, if you will, in the ministry. Uh, they've got, they found out the will of God for their life. They found out the calling of their life. That's what a lot of little children are trying to wonder, the disciples. When you're a disciple of Christ and you're growing in the Lord, you know what you're asking yourself? What does God want me to do with my life? When God finally shows you the direction I want you to go in, you start becoming this young man. And the Lord says, I want you to do this. And so you start applying your strength to it. He says in verse 14, I've written unto you young men because ye are strong. And the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. You know what young men are? Young men are strong. They're the workers. They're the soldiers. They're the fighters. They're the ones who charge into battle. The Bible says in Lamentations 3, 27, It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Okay? The young men, they have the strength. They have the energy. They have the vitality, the love for adventure to get the work started. I'm not necessarily referring to physical young men, but these are spiritual uh, stages in your Christian life. And uh, the young men, what they lack in wisdom, they make up for in zeal. And uh, that's not necessarily bad. That's just natural. I want to point out that zeal and youth are a good thing. Okay? Sometimes older men have a way of extinguishing the flame of youth. And uh, yes, youths can make a mess of things. <laughs> yes, youths aren't as wise as the aged. Yes, youths have a tendency to strike first and ask questions later. That's not, that's not a good thing. Uh, but don't be such a spiritual old fogey that you want, all you want is stability and quietness all the time. And I'm not necessarily saying that to just the people to the people here, but I'm just wherever this goes, Final Fight or online or whatever, there's, there's a number of old men in, the, in Christ who are really down, down, you know, they're downers on the young men. And because why? Because what they want is stability and they want quietness. <laughs> and young men are not known for stability and quietness. They're very uh, spontaneous and loud. Now let's face it, uh, older people, they don't like change. Everybody knows that. <clears throat> the older you get, the more set in your ways you become. And uh, the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, is a proverb for a reason. <laughs> because that's generally the case. And like I said, I've noticed that older men in the ministry sometimes tend to scorn the younger men in the ministry, almost to the point of total discouragement. I don't know why that is. The prevailing attitude is, don't get in the ministry until you are established in life, married, 
have kids, and have run a successful business. Then you can start thinking about going into the ministry. I've heard that, I've heard that type of attitude uh, kind of projected. And uh, the, you know, the problem with that is how many people, if, if they followed that advice, how many people would still have the energy and the ambition to even enter the ministry after that? I mean, for crying out loud, the more, uh, you know, more than likely the desire for the office of a bishop would be completely gone at that point because to enter the ministry would require them to completely start their life over. You see? It's not that youth is better than old age or vice versa. It's that God has created a balance here. Okay? Young men in the ministry should help and learn from older men in the ministry. But older men in the ministry should help and encourage younger men in the ministry. Not restrain them, not tie them down, not stop them from doing anything. Right? I don't know why that's so hard to figure out. I appreciate Dr. Ruckman. Uh, because he knew a lot of us were young, loose cannons and screwballs coming out of PBI. But he still encouraged the young men to go out there and do something for God. And I appreciate that. Listen, when you encourage young men to go out and light the world on fire for God, inevitably, there are going to be some things burned down that shouldn't have been burned. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's what happens. It, it happens. It's not good. It's not ideal. But the solution, like I said, is not to strap everyone down, you know, lock them in, chain them down, and have them sit around until they're older. Part of the way you learn is by messing up. Okay, And if you don't allow a kid the opportunity to mess up, he will not learn properly. You have to allow that. War comes with risk. And the Christian ministry is spiritual warfare. Hopefully there will be no collateral damage. And the older uh, ministers can help to try to mitigate that. But to withhold the troops for fear of collateral damage doesn't win the war. And the generals can't win the war without the infantry, if you will. Okay, so that's what I want to say about that. Okay, the fourth thing that the Bible gives there, you know, I just have to say these things because, <clears throat> like I said, you hear things, you hear preaching, and you hear these, you hear some of the stuff that goes around, and I have to ask myself, I don't know if I really agree with that, you know, sometimes. So that's that's my take on that. Fathers, okay, what are fathers? Fathers, if uh, if I had to put a description of it would be men that are a little bit more established in the ministry. They're a little bit beyond the younger men. And there's a difference between a man and a father. Okay, A father is a man, but a man may not be a father. Being a father implies that you've progressed beyond youth. You know, you've entered into your middle ages and you've got a few years on you now. You're married and you have children. And with all that comes experience and knowledge that you really didn't have when you were a younger man. You thought you knew everything, then you come to find out you don't. And uh, when you become a father, you know what? Your priorities start to change. Now you're more focused on providing for your children, protecting your children, raising your children right because they're following you. Okay? And that matches a man. Uh, and you can even make some applications to women here too. I'm not just limiting it to men. But uh, you could liken it to a man who's been serving the Lord for, the while, for a while, has led some people to the Lord, has a few years on him in Christ, and has some people following them that they're somewhat responsible for now because they're an example. And the Bible likens men to fathers uh, twice in the Bible. It says, 1 John 2.13, I write unto you fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. Paul, uh, John says that twice there. And as you grow in your, in your Christian life, as you progress spiritually from a baby to a little child to a young man to a father, you know what you start to find out as you get a little bit older? You start to find out it's not all about you. <laughs> it's not so much about you. And what you can do for God, that's the young man mentality, the earlier mentality of a Christian growing. It's not so much about you and what you can do for God, but it's more about God. It's more about who He is. And it's about getting to know Him more and getting closer to Him. That becomes more of the priority than doing this and doing that. And i got to do this and i got to go. got to run, run, run. It becomes more of a mature thing. And finally, the last phase of biblical growth given in the scriptures is, uh, old, you might say, old men or the aged. Paul calls himself Paul the aged in one place in the Bible. Uh, these are men, if I had to guess, uh, if I had to put a title on it, like I said, a progression here. Uh, someone who served the Lord faithfully and has reached the end of their life and or the end of their ministry. Okay, The end of their Christian life. And these are men who have uh, left a pattern for others to follow and can encourage and instruct younger men and or younger women like Paul did for Timothy. 
All right, so here are the five stages of Christian growth that I've gone over kind of quickly. And I find one more thing kind of interesting in the scriptures. This concept from Ephesians chapter 4 that was not just the individual Christian would grow, but that the entire body of Christ would grow. Uh, it said that Paul would hope that the entire body of Christ would grow up into him in all things. Okay? And it appears that there is a depiction of growth of the body of Christ that corresponds with the length of the church age. Think about this. You know how Daniel saw that image, right? In Daniel chapter 2, and he says, you know, you got the head, and then you got the arms, and the, and the upper thighs, and then the legs, and then the feet. And what that thing represented was the kingdoms of the Gentiles, and that thing expanded from uh, the kingdom of Babylon all the way to the kingdom of the Antichrist. It was a chronological thing that extended throughout history, right? There's this image of a man. You know, if you saw the Larkin chart, you got a man laying sideways, you know, going through the length of history. Well, it appears that we could maybe draw a similar figure of a man that would stretch from the resurrection of Christ right here. You know, just as Daniel saw an image along these lines, it almost seems like we could do a similar thing in relation to the body of Christ. Okay. I have already messed this up. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to do this. No, I'm not going to do that. Hold on. Hold on. I didn't draw that right. This guy's a little bit short. I can't have a midget body of Christ here. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to do this this way. This is going to be a kind of a tall guy. Okay. There we go. All right. So Jesus is the head. This isn't a head being decapitated. This is just that uh, Jesus is the head, not the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist, the prophet, the apostle. I make Jesus the head. And when we get raptured, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Okay? So it seems like the rest of the body, it starts with the feet, and it progresses throughout history, 2,000 years roughly. Okay? Not quite 2,000 years, but approximately 2,000 years from Calvary to the rapture. All right. It starts with the feet, which is opposite of Daniel's image. Daniel's image started with the head and went down to the feet. It seems like the church starts with the feet and goes to the head. All right. And it's progressing. It's getting better, if you will. And uh, feet are the uncomely part of the body uh, that we think to be less honorable. Paul talked about these things. And when Paul spoke of himself and the other, other apostles, he said that it seemed like God had stuck them at the very last, at the very bottom, because they were constantly made a spectacle to the world and to angels and to men. You remember that? And he says, nevertheless, upon these uncomely members, the apostles, we bestow the more abundant honor. Okay? The apostles, they were, I mean, you can't match the apostles. They were amazing, these, the way that God used these apostles. But during the time of the apostles, you have the miracles, the signs, the wonders that were primarily for the Jews, and then those uh, signs come and go with the death of the apostles. After the apostles are gone, there's no more of these signs and wonders really going on like it did in their day. When Peter walked past a guy, his shadow healed a guy. You don't have that stuff going on past there. Why? Because the signs are for the Jews. And God is shifting his attention to the Gentiles. At the end of Paul's life, he couldn't even he couldn't heal himself. He couldn't heal Epaphroditus. He said, I've left him at Miletus sick. Why? Why didn't you just heal him, Paul? Because he couldn't. Those signs were, were going out. All right? And the apostles wrote the New Testament scriptures, but it would be quite a while before those documents would really spread around to all the Christians. You remember it took about 400 AD before those they had the first collated version of the 66 books of the Bible. And so those prophets, God supplied prophets in the early days of the church to speak to the people the words of God. The originals, if you will, were being written by the apostles. They were starting to be copied and spread around. But during that time, most people didn't have those copies. You know, they might live their entire life never reading the document of 1 Thessalonians. So God had some prophets that were speaking the words of God to the people and in a lot of cases, the prophets are just like a preacher. And uh, sometimes they're able to foretell future events. They're a lot like the Old Testament prophets in that regard. Um, but uh, the, of a prof the office of a prophet has likely pretty much disappeared. Why? Because we have a completed version of the Bible now. I don't need somebody to tell me what's going to happen in the future because I've got a whole book full of stuff that I still haven't figured out all the future events it has in here. I've got the future. 
It's in this book. I don't need a prophet to tell me. And besides, if we are, you know, people say, well, there are prophets running around these days that can predict the future and stuff like that. Now, I don't know about that. I sort of wonder sometimes. If there was a guy that could go around and predict the future and accurately nail it every time, and he said, I'm a prophet of God, you know what people would do? They would direct their attention to that person and it would go away from this book. But if you don't have this book, hey, that'd be handy. <laughs> you know, somebody that could preach, say, thus saith the Lord. Oh, thank you. I was wondering what, thus, what the Lord had to say, because I don't have a Bible. You know, so that's handy. So that, the prophets, he had, the Lord used prophets in those early days. And um, it doesn't look like there's any more of them anymore. Or if there are, it's a very rare thing. All right. Then come the evangelists. You have the evangelists in Ephesians chapter 4. And the, under the title of evangelists, you could put uh, missionaries. You could put circuit riding preachers. You could put the revivalists like Charles Finney, D.L. Moody, Billy Sunday. You could put the modern evangelists, if you will, like uh, guys like David Spurgeon, Mark Rogers. They could fall under this title of evangelists. They're, going, they're people that are going around uh, preaching the gospel. And evangelists is somewhat a broad term. And evangelists have basically been around from the beginning of the church to the end of the church. So they could kind of span this whole thing. But uh, then you have the pastors and the teachers. And like I said, here in Ephesians chapter 4, it doesn't, it doesn't put a comma between those two. It says pastors and teachers, meaning they go together. And uh, that, like I said, part of the reason is because every pastor is supposed to be a teacher, but not every teacher is necessarily supposed to be a pastor or needs to be a pastor. So pastors are teachers, but not all teachers are pastors. Okay, Now, there have been some notable pastors in history, such as uh, Charles Spurgeon, John R. Rice, Jack Hiles, J. Frank Norris. But as we get to the end of the church age, and this is kind of what I want to park here on, as we get to the end of the church age, uh, we're finding that there's no apostles, no prophets, fewer evangelists, and fewer pastors. And it really seems like, if you, ask, if, if you ask me, it looks like we've entered into the age, basically, of the teachers. And I would put the teachers as far back as Clarence Larkin in the late 1800s or whatever, Schofield, Bollinger, and uh, up until the recent times with Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, uh, guys like Sam Gipp, Gene Hawk Kim's doing a great job, Will Grady. Teachers. Teachers. There's a lot of teachers. And by the way, in every age, there's always been a counterfeit. There were counterfeit apostles, counterfeit prophets. There's been counterfeit evangelists like uh, Charles Russell of the uh, 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 Charles Russell uh, of the JWs, uh, Joseph Smith. Uh, you might put him under the prophets. He was a counterfeit. Then you have counterfeit pastors, and you also have counterfeit teachers. Okay, so we're at the end of the church age. The body of Christ is aged. It's nearly two thousand years old. In its youth, uh, you know, it's strong, energetic, and you're wise, but not wise. In youth, you're strong, energetic, but not wise. In old age, you're not very strong, but you've got a lot of wisdom. And that's what we find in the last days of the church. We find more teachers than anything right now, right? You say, well, I just wish there was more missionaries. Well, I do too, but it appears that God's method, God's plan, what God is interested in right now is teachers. Teachers. It's not to say that he doesn't use pastors and doesn't use missionaries or evangelists. I'm not saying that. But God's emphasis, it seems to be, in the last days is on teachers. Now, just because there are those that heap to themselves teachers having itch itching ears, doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater. It doesn't mean that you should be, have, be of the mindset that teachers are a bad thing, because they're not. God uses teachers. He sends forth teachers to minister to the body. And evidently, according to the scriptures, it looks like God knows that in the last days of the church, you know what the church needs? Teachers. God doesn't say, in the last days of the church, God's emphasis is not saying, oh, they need evangelists. They need pastors. Seems like in the last days of the church, the Lord, said, the Lord put teachers there at the end. That's God, God did that. And uh, we are in the age of information, and Christians and everybody these days seem to have a knowledge of uh, everything except the Bible. And uh, what we now need in the information age especially, what we need is understanding of the Bible, answers from the Bible. You know, the Bible has answers to everything that's going on these days. The Bible has answers to Antifa, BLM, you know, President Trump, Russia collusion, Bill Gates' vaccine, George Soros, the Middle East problem. The Bible has answers to all that. That's what we need. Somebody's got to teach it and explain these things to people. Take the 
current information and filter it through the Word of God and explain these things to you. The Bible has the answers. But it's astounding and amazing how ignorant Christians are of the Bible. They know TikTok. They know Wikipedia. You know, they know QAnon. They know their church's uh, denominational beliefs. But they can't tell you why they believe what they believe. Well, somebody just said. They just told me that. Why do you believe it? They can't show it to you from the Bible. God needs, God's sending out teachers. God wants His people to know His book. And I believe God has greatly used men like Dr. Ruckman to advance our knowledge of the Bible. And I believe that God is using guys like Gene Hakim and ministries like PBI and Final Fight Bible Radio to uh, spread that knowledge out. I believe that. But uh, the church is in its twilight years. And God is feeding the church with knowledge and understanding of the Word of God. And what we're waiting for is for the head to appear. For Jesus Christ to return. Now just in conclusion, it's interesting that the last sign, the last sign preceding the rapture, in, according to 2 Thessalonians, is the appearing of the man of sin. And revealing who that is, that's not the expertise of an evangelist. And revealing who the man of sin is, because he says there's going to be a falling away first, the man of sin shall be revealed, and then that day can come. All right, so we have to know who that man of sin is. Okay, revealing who the man of sin is—that's not the expertise of a pastor, but it is the expertise area of expertise for a teacher. And the same with goes with trying to find out the date of Christ's coming. If God allows us to know the date, it will probably be revealed by the Holy Spirit to one of His teachers who are diligently studying His Word and believe His Word. So that's where we're at. And that's partially why I spend a lot of time teaching here at this church. So you say, it's the 11 o'clock hour. You're not supposed to be teaching. This is supposed to be time for preaching. Well, preaching is still important. And obviously we do preach here. And I preach. But the Lord has given me some ability to teach. So most of my efforts are along the lines of what God has equipped me with. Uh, but that's where we're at. I seem to see this today. It's not to say, uh, you know, a teacher is more important than a pastor or anything like that. It's just, these are the callings of God, and these are things that are important. These are things that God has set in place to minister and edify the body. So this lesson itself was a teaching lesson. I hope you learned something. I hope you were fed this morning, and I hope you have a to-go box full of things to chew on for the rest of the week. All right, let's end with a word of prayer. Father, I come before you this morning. I thank you for your book. Thank you, God, for your wisdom. And God, uh, I pray that there'd be some things that would be edifying to your people this morning and give them something to think about. I pray, Father, that... Uh, You'd help all of us to identify where we are at in our stage of Christian growth and help us to be honest. Uh, if we're a baby, help us to progress, help us to grow. If we're little children as disciples, uh, show us wisdom as to what your will is for our life. Help us to be seeking that and just help, uh, help your people to grow spiritually, Lord. We want to be wise. We want to be uh, people that can be good examples to others and train others uh, to be a blessing to others. And, and just we want to minister to the body of Christ, not be like a little baby that has to be ministered to all the time. Help us, Lord, to grow up into in Christ. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Please bless it as it goes out, wherever it goes. We trust you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Yep. Uh, I don't know about that. Let me uh, turn this off here.